This video series was three years in the making and we've come a long way, covering nearly four billion years of paleo history and at least 70 named clades or evolutionary stages from mere molecules to man. There's no time to recap all that though because there's still so much left to cover that this one episode will have to be a mini-series all by itself. I had originally planned to end this series with a brief explanation of our species, but I just finished a semester of primatology, paleontology, anthropology, and archaeology, and I'd like to share at least some of that with you, so we're going to stretch this episode into three parts with an epilogue. A lot of people think that apes are one category and that humans are a distinctly separate set. However, Throughout evolution, at every level, we see that there tends to be more variation within groups than between them, and this is consistent throughout humanity. For example, there is more genetic variance between chimpanzees and gorillas than there is between chimpanzees and humans, so we're literally all part of the same family. And comparing humans with the other apes, we notice that the ribs of chimpanzees and australopiths are splayed, such that the gut is wider than the chest, and this is typical of herbivores like cattle, for example because raw vegetation is so tough to digest. Anthropoid primates also have a problem digesting unprocessed meat, which is why the other apes eat so little of it. But the skeletons of early humans show a different shape to our torso, indicating that they had overcome this problem and changed their diet to be much more dependent on meat, which they somehow processed more efficiently. We didn't evolve carnivorous digestion. Instead, we used technology to tenderize the meat before eating it. The tough consistency of both plant and animal matter can be softened either chemically or physically. The earliest evidence of cooking food is from only a half million years or so ago, but we're looking at another million years or so before that. And before the earliest people knew how to harness fire, they could tenderize meat by pulverizing it against stones. That takes just as long as cooking it, though it won't make it taste any better and you might get gravel in your teeth, but the increased protein intake enabled the next necessary adaptation, encephalization, growing a larger brain. And the most intelligent animals have a larger ratio of brain size to body mass, which is not surprising, but evolutionary changes are always slight and they're not cumulative unless there's a selective pressure to keep building in that direction. No animal is ever going to get a human-sized brain from a single mutation. They could get one that's a little bigger than everyone else's, but to further enhance intelligence, we need more tools to keep building on that foundation. And comparing monkeys to other notably intelligent animals like dolphins, elephants, octopods, parrots, and crows, we see that of all these lottery winners who got that slightly bigger brain, most of them also have a social structure requiring communication skills and that is a necessary element to provide selective pressure to increase brain size even more, which is why elephants, whales, and dolphins have even bigger brains than they could have gotten just from random mutations alone. And out of all these, only monkeys are sufficiently social and equipped with supple, dexterous hands with which to examine things or to make tools or to try to perform even the simplest chemical experiment. An octopus has the know-how and the wherewithal to open a jar, but it can't have any experience with fire. Monkeys are the only animals in this whole set who can even bang two rocks together. Other animals have hands, but none of them have a lifestyle that requires innovation or problem-solving skills, nor do they have the necessary social structures required to continually build up their intelligence. And one of the trends in primatology, the comparative study of different species of primates, is the apparent correlation of brain size to group size. Unlike other social animals, primates have relationship hierarchies requiring that they recognize both kinship and rank of different individuals within their troop, as well as having to recognize their own relative position within that community. And they have to interpret social cues, body language, in order to avoid offending certain individuals and to empathize with others because they need to build alliances to become more valuable to the group and thus fulfill their own needs. These are some of the reasons that monkeys have a larger brain size to body mass than most other animals. And the ones living in larger communities have to be smarter still, so they have an even bigger brain size by proportion. They, they have to be smarter just to know who they are compared to everyone else. And that situation was exacerbated in people because there was so much more that even primitive humans like Homo habilis needed to comprehend beyond what other monkeys and apes do. Mammals that hunt in packs tend to coordinate movements and strategies, and when you're smart enough to get to that point and you have dexterous hands to work with, you could use them to open even more doors of opportunity, to solve even greater puzzles, and the beginning of that 
is making and using tools. Up to this point, chimpanzees were right there with us. So how did we get beyond them? The answer is a suite of genetic mutations which occur randomly and uniquely in one individual in a given collective and are subsequently spread to his or her descendants and eventually the entire group via population genetics, where that same mutation did not occur in anyone from any of the other groups. In this way, mutations distinguish new taxa emerging from within the original parent gene pool. Beneficial mutations have been precisely defined and positively identified. And some of these have been shown to increase complexity and even add new genetic information, but beneficial mutations can come from deletions, too. While studying the human-specific loss of regulatory DNA and the evolution of human-specific traits, scientists were able to identify 510 deletions from the ancestral primate genome, causing significant regulatory changes in descendant groups. And one of those was the loss of a tumor suppressor gene, which is uh, which left us susceptible to brain cancer, but also resulted in the expansion of specific regions of the human brain. So even growing big brains can be correlated to the deletion of genes from the primate genome. Of course, there's more to it than just that. Uh, remember that in the last episode, we learned how we'd lost some of the muscle mass that other apes have. It wasn't just one mutation that did that. In our case, natural selection accumulated a few different mutations in specific areas. For example, this study shows that powerful masticatory muscles for biting and chewing are found in most primates, including chimpanzees and gorillas, and were a prominent adaptation of Australopithecus and Paranthropus, extinct genera of the family Hominidae. In contrast, masticatory muscles are considerably smaller in both modern and fossil members of Homo. The evolving hominid masticatory apparatus traceable to a late Miocene chimpanzee-like morphology shifted toward a pattern of gracilization nearly simultaneously with accelerated encephalization of early homo, meaning that we got weaker than the other apes as we grew smarter than them. So it's a trade-off. The study goes on to say that the gene encoding for the predominant myosin heavy chain expressed in these muscles was inactivated by a frame-shifting mutation after the lineages leading to human and sun chimpanzees diverged. Loss of this protein isoform is associated with marked size reductions in individual muscle fibers and entire masticatory muscles. Using the coding sequence for the myosin rod domains as a molecular clock, they estimated that this mutation occurred approximately 2.4 million years ago, predating the appearance of modern human body size and emigration of Homo out of Africa. This represents the first proteonomic distinction between humans and chimpanzees that can be correlated to a traceable anatomic imprint in the fossil record, meaning that multiple lines of physical and molecular evidence corroborate to date to the same time. What this study shows is that we have a gene called MYH16, which is common to all primates. In gorillas, this gene causes massive chewing muscles to envelop the brain case, connecting to a sagittal crest at the top, which gives the gorilla enormous bite force. But it also keeps the brain compressed and necessarily small. In humans, MYH16 is only a pseudogene, a dysfunctional vestige of our primate ancestry. It's there, it makes a protein, but the protein doesn't work, and we only get a tiny fraction of those chewing muscles. The massive ones that envelop their brains never develop at all in us, and neither does the sagittal crest since there's nothing to connect to. Thus, the defect in this gene gives us a wimpy bite, but it allows our brains to grow. Then, another team of geneticists found three new genes collectively called NOTCH2NL. And the mutation that created these was a copy-paste error of an original NOTCH gene which creates new proteins. These genes control the growth and differentiation of stem cells in the brain, the starter cells that give rise to neurons. This mutation seeds even more nerve cells and prompts a ballooning of the cerebral cortex. That's the 10% of the brain responsible for our language, imagination, and problem-solving abilities. Contrary to popular belief, you use the other 90% too, but that's for systemic regulation, motor functions, and that sort of thing. Oh, and emotional things like, you know, fight or flight, that sort of thing. Um, this 10%, also called the gray matter, accounts for all of our higher order thinking skills that set humans above all other animals. And remember that evolution is not like what you see on the X-Men. It's not like one mutation ever caused a whole bunch of orchestrated changes body-wide all at once in a single individual. Quite the opposite, in fact, where a handful of mutations might cause only one significant change. 
even then, it's not an evolutionary change until it spreads through the population over many generations. Generally speaking, the bigger your brain is, the smarter you are. And chimpanzees, gorillas, and australopiths, including paranthropines and even Kenyanthropus, all have the same brain structure and cerebral cortex that we do, only smaller, with theirs ranging from 275 cubic centimeters up to 500 cc's, which is already a large brain for an animal of that size, to be sure. Homo habilis, traditionally regarded as the first human species appearing 2.1 million years ago, showed significant improvement even over that, with a brain size ranging from 550 cc's to as much as 687 cc's. A pretty remarkable difference, really, which is reflected in their technology, how much more adept they were at crafting tools than chimpanzees are. Homo erectus, is the next sequential species appearing roughly 100,000 years later and spreading out of Africa into Europe and across Asia. They ranged in height from 145 to 185 centimeters or from shorter than Danny DeVito to as tall as me. But their brains ranged from 850 to 1100 cc's. And to put that into perspective, modern human brains range from as small as 900 cc's except in cases of microcephaly to as large as 2000 cc's although that too is an abnormal brain, the typical average being between 1350 and 1400 centimeters. In other words, the human brain tripled in size over a couple million years, which is fortunate that it took that long because that enhancement had cascading side effects, one of them being that having a big brain means having a big head, so big as to make the process of giving birth potentially deadly to both mother and child. There were two ways that our evolution accounted for that. One was that while most other mammals come out ready to run within hours after birth or are only immobile infants for a matter of weeks at most, humans are born with brains that are not yet fully developed because our brains have to grow so much that a lot of that has to happen outside the womb. So we spend years being utterly helpless and dependent on our parents while our brains try to catch up to our bodies. Our skulls aren't fully developed at birth either to make it easier to bend their way through the birth canal, and that had to change too. As the heads of babies evolved increasingly larger over many generations, the breadth of the women's hips had to widen to accommodate, otherwise they would have died in childbirth as an evolutionary dead end. That, unfortunately, is how natural selection works. The widening of the female pelvis led to a greater expression of sexual dimorphism than we see in the other apes, where males and females are more distinct from each other. And it didn't stop there, either. Because women might have two or three infants to carry at one time, it was best that they huddle together while men defend them rather than attempt to run away, which was usually impractical anyway. So you end up with monogamous relationships where the male defends the female, who is in turn looking after his brood. And one of the effects of long-term pair bonding on females is that they no longer have obvious ovulation. They have hidden estrus because they don't have to advertise when they're fertile. They already have a dedicated partner, usually for life, because infant mortality was so high. Half of all pregnancies end in miscarriage even today, and centuries ago, most kids died of myriad other causes before they even made it to maturity. It was so bad that some communities didn't even bother to name their kids for the first couple of years, just to make sure they'd, be, they'd live long enough to be worth the effort. And the only reason kids don't d still die at that rate now is because of medical science. Of course, that's also why the global population has exploded exponentially, doubling and then doubling again just in the span of one potential human lifetime. How long can we keep that up? Now, way back when, child rearing had become such an expensive investment that it couldn't be managed by a single parent, not in those living conditions. Instead, as the old adage said, it often required a whole village to raise a child. There is more to cover about the humanization of the ape in the next couple episodes. For right now, just remember that a large part of the reason that we developed interdependent communities out of what used to be just troops of monkeys is because our infants are so helpless, requiring so much collective time and attention for so bloody long. And the reason for that is because our brains are so big. And the reasons our brains grow so large is that the human genome has inherited so many useless vestigial monkey genes. Genes that work in them but don't work in us because our copies are broken. But we turned that to our advantage and made the most of our defective genetics.